Uh, and boom, we're on. What's up, Ian? All right, great. Hey, how's it going? Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course, man. Love, uh, excited to talk to you. The story you share, man, your book is awesome. It's such a fascinating, fun, interesting story with so many parts that come together to create this history, you know? Cool. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, it's, it's a big kind of wild story and getting it all into one kind of somewhat neat narrative was definitely part of the challenge. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Because yeah. like you literally, you cover, you know, the kind of the invention of electric guitars and everything like that through that whole scene and then also how that influenced you know uh musicians and artists and how the it's it's just so interesting how the the equipment influenced all the music like you had to have the equipment first before rock and roll could really come along and stuff as you know as we kind of experienced it yeah i think that's what people didn't necessarily realize that i wanted to show was that you know, rock and roll was like actually working with tools that were already out there and already kind of available to be, uh, you know, to help drive music into the future. And certainly, obviously, the artists were a huge part of it, but they had to have those tools. And these guys who invented them were just wild and, and brilliant. Yeah. I mean, it's like it's you don't know what's possible if it doesn't exist yet, you know? Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> Cool. So let's start off. Give us a little, little background on you because you're you're like the perfect qualification to write this book. Uh, well, thank you. I don't know if that's totally true, but yeah. Um, <laughs> so I let's see. I'm a guitar player. I've been playing guitar since I was about ten years old. Um, I will say, however, that I'm a better writer than I am a guitar player. Um, thank God. Um, <laughs> and you know, I started writing about music when I was basically in high school and kept it up through college. Um, after college, I was a newspaper reporter and then I became a music critic and journalist um, at San Francisco Weekly for a good number of years. And, you know, I was like covering concerts every night, interviewing musicians every day and came to really understand how important musicians' tools were to them and how much those tools enabled them to kind of be creative in the way that they wanted to be creative. And, um, I, you know, I knew the story of Fender a little bit um, and that, but once I started really looking into it later on, I just got so fascinated by this idea that the guy who, who kind of developed the electric guitar as we know it couldn't even play. <laughs> yeah. It's... Yeah, how did that come about? So that was what I really wanted to could look into. Yeah, no, it's crazy. So how did you, was your official title, were you a music critic? Is that what you said? Um, I was a music editor, so I was a mix of, you know, a critic, a kind of journalist, reporter, um, and then just kind of managing a music section at a weekly newspaper. Okay. So, I mean, it seems like a dream job to go to, you know, all these concerts and, and get to listen to all this stuff and review it. Was that the case or was it like anything where there's, you know, the drudgery involved too? Uh, it was both. I mean, it was definitely 100% a dream job. It was the most fun job I've ever had and kind of can ever imagine having. There's nothing like, you know, when you're in your mid-20s, being able to just go to any concert you want at any night, you know, go to any club, basically hang out with whoever you want. Like, it was super cool. Um, it was also pretty difficult, you know, from from a, a practice point of view, like journalism is going through this big upheaval and it was hard to kind of figure out what we should be doing and and to make um, local music coverage succeed on the web. And there were all kinds of challenges that did make mm -hmm. it a little bit of a drudgery. But I mean, overall, can't complain. It was awesome. Right. No, that's yeah. that sounds cool. Sounds fun. Um, cool. Let's dive into the story. Um, well, first of all, what's cool, too, is reading this uh you know, Leo Fender was in Fullerton and you talk about Placentia and stuff. That's I literally grew up in Placentia. That's where my childhood oh, really? home is. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that's it's cool. Really and I think cool. there's I don't know if you've ever been there, but there's a a small like Fender Museum in downtown Fullerton. Yeah, definitely. I have been there. And actually one of the um, sort of Fender experts that I worked with to kind of get myself into the research was the curator there, Richard Smith. Uh, for a oh. long time. Yeah, sweet. Yeah, yeah, so it was it was cool to hear all that stuff mentioned in the story. But yeah, let's get into it. Um, I mean, should we just start with kind of the first electric guitars when they start to come around and, and what they're like? Sure, yeah. Um, so, I mean, at the beginning of this story, I think what people don't necessarily realize is that there were 
electric guitars back in like the mid 1930s and early 40s but they were really different from how we think of them today like they were basically acoustic guitars with like a little bit of electric amplification added and that was kind of how people thought about it like there was this big era in the first part of the 20th century where electricity came around and people were like let's use electricity to solve all of our problems and one of the problems they thought about solving was that this guitar which is a really cool instrument but was too quiet to be all that useful could get louder but they didn't think about like how could we just completely reinvent the guitar they were just like all right well we'll make it a little louder and the problem with what they did was that when you add just a little electric pickup onto an existing acoustic guitar what happens when you turn it up too loud is it feeds back because the, the sound from the amplifier gets cycled in and get gets picked up by the pickup in the electric guitar reverberates around that acoustic body and you get this crazy feedback so the you couldn't get very loud you know and players like electric guitar players especially but all musicians they always want to get louder right that's mm-hmm. what they that's just that's where you go you just go louder everyone wants to go louder so <laughs> um <clears throat> books like les paul were experimenting with this technology and playing these early electric guitars and they were always trying to go louder people who were working uh, in the bands that Leo Fender helped initially in 1940s in Fullerton wanted to go louder. And so these guys thought, okay, well, let's figure out a way to do it. And to do that, they basically had to reimagine what the electric guitar could be and think of it as purely an electric guitar and have no acoustic properties whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So getting rid of that acoustic box made it so that you could turn it up louder without feeding back. And that's how you got... Jimi Hendrix, basically. Right. Cool. So just to jump back, like how does, so the pickup would literally pick up the sound from the amplifier. Was that the issue? So the issue was that when you, like the, so an acoustic guitar has this hollow body, right? That yeah. it's like a box. And when the string vibrates, that box, the air in that box vibrates too. And then that amplifies naturally the sound. But with an electric amplifier, when the when the guitar when that guitar is amplified, the sound from the amplifier also reverberates inside that box and makes the guitar a lot more prone to feedback than with the solid body guitar where there's no box; it's just a plank of wood with a pickup on it. Does that I make see. sense? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that that does make sense. And so, so, no, so go any ahead. guitar, any guitar with any acoustic property. Like whether it's a thin box or a thick box of like your typical acoustic guitar is going to feed back more than like a solid body or a guitar without that acoustic property. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. And then, and so that's just initially what they did was, cause that's what a guitar was. No one even thought to make it solid. Yeah. I mean, it was just like this, well, <clears throat> you know, the guitars were, um, th- these acoustic sort of hollow body guitars that people were using were beautiful. They had this wonderful kind of warm, you know, rich sound. And the idea of getting rid of that was just like what, crazy. Like that was just insane. Why would you do that? that? That's what the instrument is. And you're talking about getting rid of it. And, you know, to be fair to those kind of naysayers, amplified guitars at that point didn't actually sound as wonderful and as rich and as full as they do now. That technology hadn't progressed that much. So you were trading something that was reliable and beautiful for something that was Okay, louder, but maybe a little bit more rough hewn and not as proven. Okay, makes sense. And then, so just to kind of get an idea, do you know, like, how loud you could really go with these initial electric guitars? So, okay, so think about like a trumpet or a saxophone. Uh huh. No, a guitar could not get that loud oh. with amplified without feeding back. Like, that was kind of one of the main issues was that. The electric guitar, you know, in in the music of the day, amp saxophones and trumpets and brass instruments in general were really popular, and electric guitars couldn't really coexist with them. They couldn't go that loud. Okay, yeah, so that's tough. Even initially, it's if you're, it's hard for the electric guitar to exist with anything else. Then, yeah, yeah, yeah man, exactly. man, oh man. And then, so real quick too, because I'm not super clear on this. How maybe I would, I don't know if you know for sure, but like, how does a can you explain how a pickup sort of works? Yeah, absolutely. So a pickup is a really, really very, very simple device. Basically what it is, is it's a magnet wrapped with magnetic 
or sorry, wrapped with copper wire. And we're talking like thousands of wraps, like 7,000 wraps, 10,000, 9,000. And what happens is that basically there's this electrical principle of induction, whereas so that this, this magnet wrapped with copper wire produces a magnetic field just naturally. And when you have an electric string vibrate in that field, it disturbs it, right? Because it's also metal. So there's a kind of electromagnetic reaction happening there. So the pickup, the, the coils, the magnetic coils in the pickup, pick up that vibration, that disturbance in this magnetic field, and then transmit it to an amplifier. It, it creates what they call a signal, an electric signal. And like, this might sound complicated. This is really super basic electric stuff. Like this is how your telephone, like your, your old school landline, you know, dial telephone works. This is like very common technology. And so the, the pickup itself was not a technological breakthrough. It had existed for a long time. It was just a matter of how do you use the pickup in a way that lets the guitar kind of become itself. I see. So they had they had the technology and just kind of slapped it on the guitar to do what they had kind of done before with other things. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, you know, pickups had developed and there were better better pickup designs as the thing improved. But yeah, it wasn't a breakthrough technology. Okay. Okay. So really, the main issue is the guitar can just it just can't get loud enough. It's too quiet to really be a, a useful tool on stage. In a big band setting, yeah. Okay. And That's then. The Okay, so then when do we start to see, you know, kind of Leo Fender? I guess can it get can you introduce Leo Fender and Les Paul and how they kind of come into the story? Yeah, sure. So <clears throat> we have these two guys. They're super different. Leo Fender is a farm boy, you know, raised in, in rural Southern California. Back then, there was like nothing out there in Fullerton where he was kind of was was raised. Um, it's pretty antisocial. Uh, he lost an eye in a childhood accident, so he's got one glass eye. Um, but he gets really, really good at fixing radios. And radio was like the internet of the 1920s when Leo Thunder was a kid. Like, uh -huh. you know, you had lived on a farm in the middle of nowhere. You couldn't really get any news. You didn't know what was going on. And then suddenly you got a radio and you're like listening to a live boxing match in New York City. That's happening right then. You know, you're listening to like the great orchestras like play live on the radio on Saturday night. You're listening to the great. So it's like, oh, you're connected with the world. This was like the hot technology. And Leo right. Fender was a, ma was a master of it. Mm -hmm. So he starts fixing radios. Eventually he runs a radio shop, a radio repair shop. And, you know, musicians around there have their primitive electric guitars and amplifiers they bring them to him to fix them. He starts building better amplifiers. And then eventually he starts this little company and the building amplifiers and, and steel guitars. And the folks there are like, hey, why don't you build a regular guitar too? And he does. And after much sort of tribulation and, and difficulty, we get the first Fender solid body electric guitar, uh, the Fender Telecaster. Right. Yeah, it's so cool how he wasn't, I think this is like, the fact that everybody, nobody, it kind of blows everyone's mind is that Leo Fender wasn't even a guitar player. Right. That's the, that's the shocking thing. Like he was great at doing amplifiers. He was great at doing radios. Guy could not play music, couldn't play an instrument at all. He tried saxophone. He tried piano. You know, it, it just didn't take with him. It wasn't how his mind worked or whatever. Yeah. Um, but he loved guitar. That's what's so funny too. He really loved it. Oh, yeah. Cool. And he would literally just take, talk to musicians, they would tell him what they wanted, and he would work on it and try to get it for them. So like, you know, it worked in that sense where he had his like, he had the pulse on the on what musicians wanted so he could build it. Exactly. Like he would build something like in his workshop, and he would drag it off the table and take it to like a honky tonk or like a bar that night and bring it up to some musician and be like, hey, man, try this, like plug this in, see how, see what you think about it. And they'd be like, oh, damn, that's a good one, Leo, you know, and like <laughs> and one thing would lead to another. And, and people started buying his amplifiers. You know, there was this huge country music scene in Los Angeles at the time. And the country music guys wanted to be louder. They wanted to be flashier. And they, they uh, saw, like, saw the Spender stuff and they were like, damn, that's pretty cool. And it sounds really loud and, you know, sounds good. So they adopted it. Mm -hmm. And then, so this is happening in, in the 40s time frame? Yeah, so Leo Fender started his company in 1946. Um, his first 
sort of electric solid body electric guitar prototype was out in 48 and then the fender telecaster really didn't hit until about 1951 okay yeah and he had a tough time going so t- can you kind of take us through like the his evolution and like prototypes that he he came up with yeah so one of the important things about this story is that it's not just fender and les paul there was another guy there were other people and one of them is this guy paul bigsby who was another kind of brilliant craftsman tinkerer musician guy hanging out in la and he had built a prototype solid body electric guitar for this musician named merle travis and this was a totally radical instrument when it came out in 1948 it was beautiful made of really fancy wood and it was a you know, basically like a solid body guitar is today. Um, it was thin, you know, it had a, a full size body. Um, it had this beautiful neck with this beautiful headstock. And Leo Fender saw Merle Travis playing that one night. And he was friends, Leo, Leo and Paul Bigsby knew each other, were sort of friendly, sort of rivalrous. Leo saw Merle Travis making that, borrowed it, because Merle Travis let Leo borrow it, because that's yeah. the world that people lived in in 1948. Um, and then, the story is that Leo basically developed his own version of that, a much cheaper, more mass producible, um, kind of less flashy version. Um, and something like that became the Fender Telecaster. Okay. So is, is Bixby kind of credited with creating the first uh, solid body electric guitar? The first of that kind, yeah. I mean, Bixby never... It's, you know, it's, it's, if we can, I, I like to sort of divide up the credit a little bit because definitely Bigsby, you know, Travis sketched this thing out. Camille Travis sketched out. Paul Bigsby kind of built it. But Paul Bigsby never was thinking like, oh, I'm going to put one of these in every kid's hands in America. You know, he was never like, oh, I want to make a thousand or 10,000 of these. Like, I'm going to make one. And if someone comes and bugs me, I guess I'll make some more. Mm-hmm. Um, and Fender was like looking for that thing that was going to, you know, Get, be able to be sold across the country. So they were very different. But yeah, Paul Bigsby definitely pioneered what we know today as the solid body guitar and Leo Fender kind of perfected it and popularized it. Right. That's interesting because Leo Fender kind of has the, he he seems like more of an engineer, tinkerer, kind of likes to do that stuff. But he had more of a, a business sense than Bixby in that, in that realm, I guess. Yeah, I think he had... Uh, maybe more ambitions. You know, he was younger than Bigsby. Bigsby had had a a number, like a career doing a number of like really interesting things before then. Um, And, you know, Leo had partnered with um, a businessman who was distributing his amplifiers across the country. And they were trying to get his line of amplifiers everywhere, Texas and Florida and New York and, you know, Oklahoma. And so they had this line of products. And so they wanted to build that line of products and adding an electric guitar to it just, you know, obviously made a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Man. Okay. So, so Leo Fender sort of was kind of improving on the existing technology of the kind of hollow body wood electric guitar and just made it better and better. And it was, it was good for musicians and it was able to get louder and stuff. But then it's really, once he saw the guitar from that Bixby created that he's like, Oh, well, I'm going to do, let's do this solid body thing here. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty right. We should say, too, that Leo was building what they call steel guitars, which are important. That was a big country music instrument. And if you've seen like a country guy play a flat guitar with like a metal slide, Fender was building those at the very beginning. And so those designs really informed a lot of what they ended up building for their standard guitars in terms of the look and the sound and that kind of thing and the technology. They borrowed a lot of technology from their own steel guitars. Okay. Okay, I see. Cool. And then, so let's jump to Les Paul. How does he fit into this? Sure. So, you know, if Leo Fender is quiet and introverted, Les Paul is is wild and charming and outgoing. You know, he was born in Wisconsin. Uh, he's like five years younger than Leo Fender, six years younger than Leo Fender. Um, he's basically the class clown and the kind of like center of attention from the moment he, you know, arrives on the planet. His mother worships him. He's like learning harmonica from from workmen on the street when he's eight years old. Um, and he's just like basically this brilliant entertainer musician. Um, he quits high school early to go become a professional guitar player. 
getting like a lot of money at the height of the depression, or not the height, at the beginning of the depression. Um, and he's just like, he's a freaking star. He's like a guy who kind of creates his own reality in this amazing way. And, you know, he tells a lot of telltales and, and kind of like fibs his way into situations. Um, but he's just, just kind of this magnetic personality. Um, so he's bounced around and he's been playing in these fancy radio orchestras in New York. Uh, during World War II, he came out to California. He started playing with Bing Crosby, who was this huge popular jazz singer, like one of the most popular singers of the 20th century. Um, and the whole time, Les is like really frustrated with his electric guitars because he wants them to be louder and kind of more expressive than they are. Um, and Les is a person who takes matters into his own hands, right? He's tirelessly energetic. He stays up for two or three days at a time without sleep, tinkering and playing music and recording and, and doing whatever, God knows whatever else. Um, so in the 40s, Les had built himself this proto, in 1940, this prototype electric guitar called the Log, which was basically just like a plank of wood, like a box of wood with a pickup on it and a guitar neck. So kind of just like the essence of what an electric guitar would become. And, you know, he built this thing because he thought it would solve his problems, right? It would be louder. It would sustain better. It would be cooler and more expressive. Mm -hmm. He took it to Gibson, this big, fancy American guitar company, and tried to get them to produce it. And they were like, yeah, right. dude. <laughs> like, <laughs> this thing looks like a like junk. Like, we're not making this. Mm -hmm. um, but Les kind of sensed that he was maybe on the right path with this whole idea of a solid body guitar. So years later, he ends up in L.A. And he's kind of in the same circle with Fender and Bigsby and these country musicians. Um, and in L.A., Les Paul has a garage studio in his backyard, which is a thing that not many, almost no one had basically then. And so his house becomes a magnet for people like Bigsby, people like Fender and the musicians that they worked with. And... Basically, they all sit around and, and talk about how to improve the technology of the electric guitar um, <clears throat> and how things should how things should develop. Les Paul isn't like quite as brilliant an engineer as Fender is, but he's a player and he's something of an engineer. Mm -hmm. um, and he's also on stage every night, you know, performing. So a lot of different things happen, but eventually Les Paul becomes this huge pop star with his wife, Mary Ford. It's another amazing story there. Um, and kind of after Fender has released its Telecaster, despite the kind of consternation of the music industry, the instrument industry, that this crazy plank guitar, Gibson finally comes back to Les Paul and says, hey, we want to make something like this. Can we put your name on it? And thus was born the Gibson Les Paul guitar in 1952. Nice. And yeah. then so... Uh, is it wasn't if I'm remembering correctly the story of the um, the log was that it initially was literally just like a a block of wood and he took it out and it just was kind of unremarkable looking. Yeah, exactly. So he had this plank of wood. Just picture like literally a, bl a block of wood, nothing else. Um, and he tried it at a bar in Queens, and apparently no one reacted really. Um, and so he's like, huh, I, you know, he thought maybe the look of it was the problem. So he'd been building it at the Epiphone Instrument Factory in Manhattan. So he went back to the factory and he got the kind of sides of like a normal hollow body guitar and just like screwed them onto it. So it looked like a guitar, but also kind of weird and different. And he took that back to the bar and then everyone went crazy for it, apparently. So he learned, he said, the audiences listen with their eyes. Mm -hmm. That was his, his kind of takeaway from that. Yeah. That's so fun too to hear the uh, aesthetic design of all these guitars because it, it really did matter and everyone thought these things were looked so futuristic and stuff, you know. Yeah, the aesthetics are a huge part of it. I mean, part like the statement is is in a lot of ways how it looks. Yeah. You know? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Man, it's so fun. Okay, so so then really the first guitar that Fender released is the Telecaster, correct? Yep. Okay. Exactly. And that thing, it's not, how was it perceived at first? Basically, when Fender first showed this guitar around, people in the industry were like, they called it a canoe paddle with strings. They called it a toilet seat. 
um, you know, they basically laughed at it and said, who the heck is going to want that? Um, and you have to remember, you know, the instrument industry was really based in the, on the East Coast and the music on the in, in the Midwest and music over there was like really different from what people were listening to in California. So the people, you know, they're like, we've never seen these country musicians in LA. We don't know what their music sounds like and we don't care. Like this thing's, um, you know, a disaster basically, yeah. but it's sold, you know, people wanted it. Mm -hmm. Man. Yeah. It's interesting how, I mean, I'm not a guitar player, but it seems like the two major brands are kind of Gibson and Fender, but Gibson's been around a lot longer than Fender has. Yeah. Gibson was founded back in like 1894 uh, initially and yeah, it's been around forever. And Fender just kind of started up in the back of a radio shop in, in 46. Yeah. And Gibson on you know, the whole our solid body thing. Because they, they, well, okay, I'm jumping ahead. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, then, so the Fender does the, um, the Telecaster, then the Stratocaster comes out. How, how far after that? So, Fender puts out the Telecaster, then Gibson puts out the Les Paul to compete with the Telecaster. And then right. Fender is like, oh no, like the huge American high quality guitar company is competing with us. Let's come up with something better. So two years later, after a lot of R&D and some serious struggles, they put out the Fender Stratocaster, which is probably Fender's most famous electric guitar. Mm -hmm. That's the one with the two horns and the very curvy body. Um, you've seen it in the hands of Eric Clapton and Jimi Hendrix, um, Jeff Beck, and, and just like really countless other people. Um, and that's kind of Fender's masterpiece because it solves all these things that were wrong with the tele not wrong, but they there were players had complained about some things with the Telecaster that it was like uncomfortable to play because of the shape of its body and that you mm -hmm. couldn't tune it precisely enough. And there were a couple other things. And the Stratocaster was like kind of a perfect electric guitar. Yeah, it was like literally uh, like very thin on the edges and stuff. So it contoured your body and was comfortable, right? Yeah, exactly. They like cut pieces out of the wood in the back so that it didn't press corners into your chest. It was really, it felt like a shirt. That was what people said about it. Oh. Um, and it had three pickups, which was like a lot of pickups instead of one or two. Um, and it had what we call now a whammy bar. So yep. you could like make the strings all change pitch together, like give the music kind of a shimmery effect or like a dive bomb like Jimi Hendrix would do. Mm -hmm. um, just, yeah, it's just a great design. Fun stuff. And then was the, was the bolt on neck, was that on the Telecaster or did that first come on the Stratocaster? So all of the Fender solid bodies had bolt on necks. Okay. That was uh, an old sort of idea that, that Leo Fender borrowed. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was then... controversial. Right. And yeah, because the, the Les Paul did not have a bolt on neck, correct? Yeah, that was one of the big differences between Gibson and Fender was that Gibson always glued, glued its necks in, um, which does give you better sustain. But if you break it and, and players were breaking guitars on the road, it was a tough life to be a musician then. Um, if you break a guitar with a set neck, you're basically screwed. I mean, you have to send that guitar away and have the neck replaced and it's so expensive and time consuming. With the bolt on neck, if you break the neck, you can just bolt a new one back on. Yeah, sweet. And change them out easily, too, and stuff. Yeah. Not that anyone ever did that, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so now we have the, we kind of have the Stratocaster competing against the Les Paul. How are they, how are they doing? How's the market perceiving them? Which one's, you know, kind of winning, I guess? Sure. So it's the 1950s. Um, we're talking mid 1950s here by the time this track comes out. Rock and roll is just coming onto the scene. Um, Les Paul, it should be noted, had this great kind of pop career for about six years. And then all of a sudden, when rock and roll arises, he's no longer a pop star. He and his generation are gone. Chuck Berry and Elvis are in. Um, and kind of what the kids want, especially after Buddy Holly arrives, are these amazing futuristic looking Fender guitars, right? So Fender has this kind of modern shapes and plastic and chrome, and they start selling crazy well, just like year over year, just gigantic leaps in sales. Um, and the Gibson Les Paul 
meanwhile, in the 1950s. It's kind of seen as a little bit old fashioned. It's expensive. It's very heavy um, because it has two different kinds of wood in the body and a bunch of other reasons. Um, and it's not that comfortable to play compared to the Fender. And so it, the sales of the Gibson Les Paul kind of decline and decline and decline. And I think they get down to like 600 or something, 650 maybe sold in, in 1959. Man. Uh, well, Fender's selling thousands of guitars, you know. Yeah, which is crazy. Like, I had no idea that the Les Paul basically went down that low, and then they stopped producing it, right? Yeah, and so what happened was, you know, Gibson changed the design of the Les Paul in a few crucial ways um, and ended up building kind of the version that we all love now in, like, 1958, 1959, 1960, with this beautiful Heritage Cherry Sunburst finishes and humbucking pickups um just amazing amazing instruments but you know no one really liked them no one could really figure out what they didn't really seem to fit with the music of the day Mm -hmm. the way that a fender did um and so by 1961 gibson had completely redesigned the guitar into what we now know as the sg which is that kind of two-horned one that angus young from acdc plays you ever seen that or like um yeah i think angus young is probably the most famous example so yeah, red and black yeah mm-hmm. so that gibson les paul went out of production by by 60 61 yeah and it was the sg was initially called the les paul right exactly so les paul had a contract with gibson they redesigned his guitar put his name on it and there's a bunch of reasons why apparently les didn't like it um, he said he didn't like the shape, that it was too pointy. He's like, you can cut yourself on those horns. Um, <laughs> but also, you know, Les is going through a divorce at the time. Uh, and, I, you know, I, there, it's pretty likely that he didn't want money from Gibson to be kind of taken from him in this divorce settlement or whatever. So he cuts off his contract with Gibson and this Les Paul SG then just becomes like the straight SG that we know now. Yeah. And SG stood for solid guitar. Solid guitar. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> what a great name. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and then Gibson also, I think it was at this time or right before the SG, they made the the Flying V and the Explorer too, right? Yeah. So, you know, Gibson's struggling in the market. They're trying to figure out how to catch up to Fender. Um, <clears throat> and they end up coming up with these crazy body shapes. So like, all right, well, we're, if we're too old fashioned, let's go totally the other way. Right. Let's go totally new fashion. And they have a guitar that looks like an arrow, which is the flying V. They have a guitar that looks kind of like a lightning bolt, which is the Explorer. Um, And, you know, these come out in like 58, 59, you know, right at the peak of like tail fin cars and, and, you know, all Mm. of that. But they don't they don't really do that well. Like people didn't really pick them up and they were kind of a bust, too. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, man. Gibson's trying, though. So what were kind of yeah? So what were kind of the um, uh, like tone differences and in audible differences between you know the Les Paul and the Stratocaster at this time? So the main difference is, you know, the Fender has a bright kind of clear, sharp uh, sound, a very kind of precise but sort of thin, trebly sound, whereas the Gibson Les Paul has a richer, warmer, thicker kind of more fluid sound to it okay and then so what who were the the bands and people that were kind of grasping on to the uh the strat famously so you know starting in the, in the mid 50s we've got like buddy holly um we've got gene vincent who's another great early rock and roller um you know elvis's band is playing fender basses by this point lots of people are playing fenders and then by the early 60s i mean it just like hits with like the beach boys and all of the surf rockers are using fenders um Mm -hmm. you know pretty much like anywhere you're seeing a solid body guitar in the very early 60s there's just a really really high likelihood that it's going to be a fender yeah yeah with surf rock and everything it was it was fun you know reading your book to go back and you know, if you got Apple Music or Spotify to go through and just listen, look up the songs that you talk about, because you can really hear the evolution of it. It's fun. 
Yeah, and I should say there's a playlist I built on Spotify that you can get to. It's called the Birth of Loud playlist. And if you search for it, it should come up. Uh, and it's got all the songs mentioned in the book, plus a few others. So you can just like work your way right through it. Sweet. Awesome. Yeah, because yeah, th that's such an important part. You got to listen to it, you know? Yeah, you got to hear it. Yeah. Um, okay, so we have this going on. Gibson is basically like done. They're They're struggling. Um, Fender's kind of on top, doing good. Um, man, what was my question that I had? The so I guess eventually we kind of get to the the downfall of of Fender. Like it starts to kind of decline, right? Yeah. So a couple different things happen. Um, one, you know, Leo Fender. He, tireless guy he's been working six or seven days a week for like t almost 20 years uh he gets tired you know he's kind of starting to burn out he's getting yeah. health, health issues um and his doctors are like you know you need to find a hobby go buy a boat you know go fishing or whatever so he's doing that and he kind of wants to get out of the company uh and so he's talking to his sales guy like the, the, the person who manages the entire sales and marketing part of the Fender project, which is this guy named Don Randall. And eventually what happens after a lot of kind of back and forth is they end up selling Fender to CBS, like the giant broadcasting recording company in 1965 mm -hmm. for like 13 million bucks, which in 1965 is a lot of money. Yeah. CBS had just bought the New York Yankees for that much, like a year mm -hmm. or two earlier. Uh, and there were a lot of jokes in the press about guitars with the Yankees. Um, and, and after that, you really start to see Fender kind of decline a little bit in terms of quality. CVS kind of came in and were like, oh, you know, we've got guys with PhDs and, and, and cost analysis. And we're just going to, you know, really, you know, make this kind of scientific. And it just they ended up cutting corners and the quality kind of declined and, and whatnot. Yeah. yeah. And they, they kind of saw Leo as like, uh, not really critical to the operation of Fender, too. Yeah, amazingly, you know, so the, CBS did this uh, sort of elaborate study of Fender uh, before they bought it for all that money, and they, they had an analysis of Leo, and they're like, well, this guy's never been to college. Um, he doesn't really seem that enthusiastic about the future. He kind of wants to just keep doing what he's doing. He doesn't really seem that important. We're sure we can come up with, like, equally good instruments on our own. And of course, how many great instruments did CBS come up with when it ran Fender? Like zero, absolute yeah. zero. So, but yeah, yeah. they kind of that's underestimated like, him. Well, that's like the cool and crazy thing is you, you know, I hopped on the Fender website uh, yesterday and they're still selling the Telecaster, the Stratocaster, the, the Jaguar. Like it's all the same instruments that, that Leo started off with. Yeah, it's it's a funny thing in that a, a, the a huge part of the electric guitar community as a whole is still very much focused around those instruments that were like pretty much perfected in the fifties and sixties. Yeah, yeah, Man, it's, and Fender it's too. Yeah, but Fenders, you know, they've done some some innovations in the past like twenty ten, past few years too. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Is they're you know they're working on all kinds of different kind of crazy. And not crazy, I don't mean to be derogatory, but like they have a new instrument that's like a semi acoustic electric that has like the ability to conjure all kinds of acoustic and electric tones in like one instrument and things like that, that, you know, are pretty radical and, and adventurous. Interesting. That's cool. Yeah. I want to check some of that stuff out. Yeah. Um, okay. This is my question. I forgot. I just, this is kind of bouncing back a bit, but the, um, the Fender precision bass was like a huge um, improvement for bass players because so can you just talk about kind of the the negatives of you know basses before the electric bass came along and then what's what leo did for that yeah so you know it's maybe hard to remember for people now but that giant upright bass that you see in the kind of jazz world like in a jazz combo i think it's like six feet tall that was the bass right for most of the first part of the 20th century like that's what people played um and not only were they quiet like they're hard to hear they don't put out that much volume they're really tough to play because they have these fat strings and they have no frets so you have to be a real pro to play one 
they're also just like super awkward to carry around. Like they don't fit in a car, even a giant mid-century American car. They wouldn't really fit in there. So people <laughs> would be putting them like on the roof of the car and then they'd fall off on the road or it would like rain. I mean, these things were just like really unwieldy and hard to play. So Leo Fender had all his musician friends. They were always kind of complaining about it and different things about it. And, and finally he was like, okay, right after the Telecaster, let's like, let's design an electric bass. Like let's come up with something that's basically like an electric guitar, but, but plays in the same sound register as the bass. So this was kind of even more difficult than designing the first electric guitar because nothing like this had ever been made before. It was a completely, completely new and original idea. But now there is someone else in Seattle who had made similar instruments. But we don't think Leo ever saw those and they didn't have a big commercial impact. Hmm. So 1952 Fender puts out this precision bass, right? That's what he called it because it had frets. So you could precisely pick what note you wanted. Not yeah. like you had to guess. And it was really easy to play. Like basically if you were a guitar player, you could just pick this thing up and it just felt like a bigger guitar and the, and the frets were the same notes. So it was really easy. Um, once again, the whole world thought Leo Fender was crazy. Like, who's going to want this? Why would we do this? You know, it's just a plank with strings on it and all that. And once again, the musicians loved it because it was like small and light and cheap and you could turn it up as loud as you wanted. And, you know, that I think was a huge change in music that people don't necessarily realize is that think about our music today. I mean, there's so much bass in it everywhere. And there has been, you know, basically since the early 60s. And it's in large part because of this electric bass where you can have these great rhythms of funk and soul and even hip hop and dance music. A lot of that comes from the Fender bass and its ability to get loud. Yeah, it's awesome. It's it's it was like such an important thing. And it's it's like we said, it's so cool where the the equipment comes along and then you can see the shift in the music right after where it gets more more bass focused because yeah. they can actually do it. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, people come up like players arise and switch to this instrument and they find these whole new kind of worlds of, of, of styles that they can play in, whole new rhythms they can put together. And it just drives musical development forward. Yeah, it's awesome. So do you know why they didn't, just on the old upright bass, why did they not have frets on that? Was there any reason for that? The instrument comes in a lineage of like a cello or a violin and just instruments that don't have have frets traditionally. Um, you know, I think it's just a different, it, it just kind of came out of, from a different family of, of instruments. And I think, uh, to be honest, I don't know a whole lot about how you play an upright bass, but my sense is that a lot of the technique revolves around kind of slides and other moves that would be really hard to do if there were frets there. Okay. And so Leah was like, just like, what the hell? We're making something totally different. Let's just add frets on it too. Well, I mean, I think he wanted it to be fretted because his idea was that guitar players should be able to play bass. Like that's what okay. like, all, all these guitar players are like, Oh, I need, I need a gig tonight. I need to make some money but there's only gigs for bass players. And so Leo was like, well, if you could just pick up the bass and, you know, plunk out a simple bass line with your guitar knowledge, you could get a gig. So that's what he did. Man. So cool. Leo. I love Leo. He's, I would have loved to meet him. He's awesome. And like, he talked about the way he would, uh, someone would ask him a question he would just like think about it for 20 minutes and then give you an answer on it. You know? Yeah, totally. He was a different sort of guy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and yeah, he was he was a little shy, a little socially awkward for sure. Um, but he had apparently a great sense of humor. Um, it's just, you know, you had to be on his level to kind of get it, I think. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine he would come off as uh, just he just wouldn't come off right if he didn't know him well or understand who he was. Um, so now can we hit on kind of the. I'm not sure exactly what time frame this is, but the, the Les Paul kind of has a resurgence, right? Yeah, exactly. So um, a couple things happened in the mid 60s to kind of dent Fender's sheen. You know, first of all, CBS buys it. Secondly, the Beatles come along and the Beatles are playing Rickenbacker guitars, which is totally a different. Rickenbacker is a really old company from actually right down the street from where Fender was started. Um, and all of a sudden, people want Rickenbackers. And then another couple of things happen. Um, actually, in London is really where this happened. 
Keith Richards from the Rolling Stones digs out what's kind of in in the mid '60s a vintage guitar. It's an old original Gibson Les Paul. Starts playing it, and of course the other rockers in the kind of London scene see it and are like, "Oh, that's kind of cool." And one of them is this guy Eric Clapton. So Eric Clapton has basically been a hotshot guitarist since he was like, whew, I mean, maybe since he was a total kid, but 16 or 17 or 18, he's been on the London scene playing in different blues bands. He's already kind of got this reputation as being an amazing player. And in a pawn shop, not a pawn shop, a used shop one day in London, he gets this old Gibson uh, Les Paul, I believe a 1960 Les Paul, which is one of the finest years of those originals. And he plays it on this record with John Mayall, the Blues Breakers. Um, and, you know, it's sometimes it's hard to kind of, like, I think outsiders don't really realize, like, can you really pin it all on this one record? And, like, you kind of can't, right? Because, <laughs> first of all, everyone saw Eric Clapton playing this guitar with that band in London. And by everyone, I mean, like, Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin, like Robert Fripp of um, you know, King Crimson, like, all of these people. So he was like the guy in London, he was playing this guitar, they heard the sound, and the record comes out in the UK and in the US, and it's this amazing, perfect blues record, but some of the most incredible blues guitar playing ever caught on record, certainly by a white guy, right? Certainly, it's just like amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so Clapton's kind of discovery of this guitar, plus Keith Richards, plus soon um, Jimmy Page, really just completely drive the Les Paul back into popularity because the new hot sound is this kind of heavy molten blues rock music that they're all playing. And this guitar really seems like the perfect instrument for it. And I should mention too, Mike Bloomfield, who's um, an American guitarist who's played with Dylan, who's played with a bunch of other people. He's also using the Les Paul at that point too. So what happens in the mid sixties or late sixties is, Everyone wants a Gibson Les Paul, and they're hard to find because no, because Gibson doesn't make them anymore, and there were only a few hundred made every year back when Gibson did make them. Mm -hmm. So, why did uh, Eric Clapton pick out the Les Paul in the first place? Was it because it kind of suited itself better to the new sound they were trying to get? You know, it's funny. It was kind of an accident. He had been trying to get, so he wanted a Les Paul, but he wanted one of the early Les Pauls the gold top and the single coil pickups because he was obsessed with this American blues man named Freddie King. And Freddie King played a Gibson Les Paul on one of his, uh, an old Les Paul on one of his great albums. Clapton wanted that, but he couldn't find it. When he went to the store in London, all he could find was this later Les Paul from 1960 with the clear finish and the humbuckers, humbucking pickups, which is a major advance of the Les Paul. So he got that instead and he also, this is a very important part of the story, had an early Marshall amplifier. And so Clapton took his Gibson Les Paul, he turned up his Marshall amplifier all the way. And with that, he got kind of what we now think of as the quintessential rock and roll guitar sound of a Les Paul and a Marshall. Um, yeah. And, you know, people heard it and just like, that's it. That's the sound. We're doing it. That's it now. Yeah. Yeah. Man, crazy. And then this it, this kind of leads to people feeling that, you know, fenders are kind of out of style now. Like they they're like these bright old colors. They look like, you know, cars from the 50s and stuff. They're just not cool anymore. Right. Yeah, totally. So a couple, you know, a lot of different things that happened. But you have to remember, like there was a huge switch in the world around 1964 and 1965, such that like everything that happened after 67, 68, with Vietnam and the kind of social protest movement kind of made everything that happened in the early 60s and earlier just look really old really quickly. And Fender had been part of that, right? Fender was Buddy Holly. It was the surf rockers. It was like the kind of early Beach Boys. And people just looked at it and they're like, you know, that's, that's just old hat. That's just out of style. And they're thin. They can't really get that really huge, heavy, distorted sound that we now, that people wanted in the late 60s. Mm -hmm. Right. And then, okay, can you can you tell me about, because this, this story was so fun, with um, about Jimi Hendrix and then kind of how he kind of got found by, I think it was Keith Richards' girlfriend at the time? Yeah, so Hendrix has been basically a sideman on the road struggling in the kind of black music live circuit in America for like, 
oh, I think it was like probably four or five years. He and he finally landed in New York. He's basically penniless. He's like sleeping in flop houses around the street, like eating every couple of days. He doesn't own his own guitar. And finally, he's playing with this like shitty band that he's in Curtis Knight and the Squires. And he's obviously the star of this band. And one night, this woman in the audience named Linda Keith sees him playing and is just kind of blown away. Like he's just this amazing. I mean, Hendrix was just this kind of incredible physical presence. But then to hear him play and to see the kind of power that he had on stage, she calls him over to her table and starts talking to him. And it turns out that Linda Keith is Keith Richards' girlfriend, right? So she's like a, I forget exactly, but maybe like a 19 or 20 year old model from London. She's hanging out in New York at the time. Um, and she and her friends take Jimi Hendrix back to her apartment on the Upper East Side and they do LSD. They listen to Bob Dylan. They kind of become friends. And so Linda Keith is like, well, you know, I do happen to be friends with like the Rolling Stones. Yeah. So she's, she kind of takes him on and tries to get him kind of famous and get him to the place where she thinks he should be. Um, and the most kind of amazing story about this is that apparently she pilfered, she took a guitar, a Stratocaster from Keith Richards' hotel room and gave it to Jimi Hendrix. Like that is, that is kind of seems like the story. There's some, some people who argue that uh, they were the ones, but I, I think it's pretty likely that actually Libby Keith was the one who gave Jimi Hendrix this, uh, this white Stratocaster that she took from Keith Richards. Yeah, man, it's so cool. It's such a crazy story. So fun. Yeah. Cool. So, uh... So and then Jimi Hendrix was pretty famously used the uh, Stratocaster throughout his whole career, right? Yeah, and it was really Hendrix. So you know, Clapton is really London, right? Um, Jimi Hendrix gets this manager who takes him to London to try to make him famous. And like a week, two or three weeks after Hendrix gets to London in 1966, he ends up on stage with Eric Clapton, who's God, right? People in London are like, Clapton is God, uh, and with his puny little Stratocaster. You know, Jimi Hendrix just goes crazy and like pulls out all of the showmanship, all of the style, all of this incredible guitar playing that he soaked up over his kind of like rough career and just blows Clapton right off the stage. Yeah. Clapton kind of retreats and is like shaking and like lights a cigarette all nervously. And then out from that moment on, London is obsessed with Jimi Hendrix and his Stratocaster. Yeah. So as, the, as Jimi Hendrix's popularity spreads, he kind of makes the Stratocaster even more iconic. And shows that it really can handle the music that was super popular in the late 60s. Mm -hmm. Man, love that stuff. That's what's so cool about the book is it's full of stories like that. Fun yeah. stuff that, you know, it's so in-depth. Um, okay, well, just kind of, to you know, we'll just kind of wrap it up here, you know. But um, so how does, how do things kind of play out and how do we get to where we are today and everything? So basically, you know, um, after Hendrix, the electric guitar sort of continues its rise in popularity for a while. Um, Fender goes through some tough years with CBS owning it. Gibson goes through some tough years with another company called Norlin owning it. Leo Fender starts a couple more companies. He never quite manages to match what he's made with Fender, um, but he lives a, a kind of nice, happy, long life. You know, he dies a pretty comfortable millionaire with a nice house in Fullerton, you know, on the hill overlooking, overlooking the valley. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Les Paul eventually like when his guitars become popular it helps him become more popular again so he's kind of been out in the woods on sort of in retirement but he becomes this kind of godfather to the whole rock and roll world because all these people grew up watching him on tv with his wife and then playing his guitars so les paul starts playing live in new york city every monday night in the early 1980s and he continues doing that amazingly up until his death in 2009 so people you know, all over the world, come to New York, see Les Paul on a Monday night, hang out with him. He's telling stories. He's telling jokes. He's playing classic tunes. He actually, like, won a Grammy in 1977, like, recording with Chet Atkins. Um, and so, you know, he just becomes this, like, huge figure in the music industry. He's, like, really recognized for a lot of technical achievements and for just being a great musician. Yeah. Well, what's funny is he wasn't even responsible for the comeback at all or, or that new style of music. It just, his name happened to be on it. His name happened to be on it. Yeah, for sure. But I think, you know, looking back, Les Paul really was in a lot of ways a hugely, 
he kind of helped bring the guitar into pop music in a way that it had never been before. And like, this was before rock and roll, you mm-hmm. know, like in the early fifties, guitar wasn't part of pop music and Les Paul and Mary Ford made it that way. Like he was on TV on the like late night shows playing his guitar. And that was really a huge influence. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Some of his early just instrumental, you know, stuff with just the guitar is really fun to listen to even today. Yeah. It's, it's really great music. Yeah. Cool. Damn. Well, this is awesome, Ian. Such a fun story. This was like just this was a great overview, I think, for people listening and and kind of will hook them and we'll leave a little cliffhanger for them to go check out your your full book and, and get that, which is uh, The Birth of Loud, Leo Fender, Les Paul and the Gu- Guitar Pioneering Rivalry that shaped rock and roll. That's on uh, Amazon. I'll have a link to that. Um, yeah. Anywhere else we should send people or, or anything like that um, for you or? You can check out my website, iansmithfort.com. Um, I'm on Twitter. If you want to hit me up there, I'm on Instagram. You can just, uh, yeah, say hi. Cool. Now I'll have links for all that stuff for people to check out. But, yeah, appreciate it, Ian. It was, it was fun. Love hearing it. Yeah, me too. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, right on, man. Well, have a good one, okay?